Well, today we have Tim Swords. Um, he was originally from Decatur, moved away to Colorado, and he came back to Decatur for some reason. Children. Okay, I They'll guess that's that. a good enough excuse. Um, he's a solution engineer right now with Horace Mann, um, had a degree from UIS in 97, and um, get this, when he was in Colorado, he was doing Delphi components, Delphi the language. Anybody remember? Um, Turbo remember power Turbo Power? Software. Did you ever buy there? Yeah. It got killed off by things like Microsoft. And again, we're doing yeah. some Microsoft talks here, so I guess it comes full circle. Um, what he's going to talk about today is the idea of advanced restful services with WCF. And uh, I'd like you to welcome him, and uh, I'm ready to listen to a wonderful talk. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Please hold your applause. Um, I got to start out by saying hello to my daughter Olivia, who is going to see this on the internet. So hi, Olivia, and Liz too. Um, okay. Anyway, uh, Scott Smith gave a presentation um, a couple months ago that kind of wet my appetite for for a little bit of this. And um, so to, uh, it, I want to thank him for giving me the inspiration to to do a little more further research on this and to see what .NET, uh, you know, how some of the tools in .NET can facilitate uh, RESTful services. So I got to figure out how to use a mouse that's a foot below the computer. OK. So some of this stuff is going to be high level. Um, I, I've hit a lot of pitfalls that I'm going to, to highlight. Feel free at any point in time to, to stop me, ask questions. It doesn't matter. Um, so anyway, we all know REST. We just might not know what happened there. We might not know that we know it. What happened? Oops. OK. Um, it's basically the way the web works. I don't know how else. The easiest way to say it, it's a, it's a, it's a uniform interface that we all know and use. We, use, we traditionally use just get and, and post is the more common, but there's uh, quite a bit more to it than that. So what my intention tonight is to, to not talk a lot about the internet, although we can't avoid just getting down into the bowels of HTTP. And so I apologize for that in advance, but it's really the way REST works. So uh, I'm going to try to formalize a little bit of the concepts around REST. That's, that's really my intent of, the, of the, tonight's talk. And to, to, to not show you how to do it, but to give you an idea of the path that I took in learning this technology. So. Uh, that said, that's pretty much what I just said. Um, so basically, uh, when, when, I, when you first start out, you kind of look at REST, put post. Let, let, me, okay, let me back up. OK. What I don't want to do tonight is, uh, is talk about SOAP versus REST. I mean, they're two disparate technologies. And there is a place in the world for SOAP. You know, SOAP has been around for a long time, the WS star stack is uh, you know very mature very stable and it has its place um, kind of more along the open source side rest has its place as well it's, it's a much simpler technology as we'll see um, it's very easy to exploit it's very easy to write it's very easy to consume so there's a lot of advantages to it but i don't want to i, I will periodically contrast it with soap and rpc but uh, that's just for illustrative purposes only OK, so what is REST, Represent, representational state transfer? Um, what does that really mean? That's a really good question, because uh, really the devil's in the details. What, what is a representation, and what is a state transfer? There's, it's a simple little acronym, but to get your head around it and to actually exploit it um, is a little more challenging, uh, I guess, on an academic level. You know, technically, it's, it's a fairly uh, simple technology. So uh, it's not HTTP, it's not the web, but the web, the web is probably, you know, the, the best testimonial to the power of REST, because it operates on the REST principles. Okay, so um, this is a topic that came up or, uh, quite often in research, item potency. And if anybody else knows how to pronounce that, please let me know. But uh, basically, all it's saying is that 
there are certain methods that are idempotent, meaning a, a delete. If, I, if I'm in a database, if I have an entity in a database, a person, Tim Swords, in a database, I call delete on him via rest. I, want to, I expect a 200 response, OK, got him deleted. Uh, if I'm there, I'm deleted. If I'm not in there, I would still expect a, a 200 OK response because the essence of what I wanted to do, I wanted to ensure that I'm not in the database, uh, is actually the, the current state. So 200, OK, you, you deleted me once, I'm deleted. You deleted me twice, OK, I'm still deleted. So item potency is basically the ability to call uh, a method repeated times and get the same result. OK, so th this is the uniform interface. This is the limited subset that REST deals with. Uh, get, put, post, and delete. And there, there's uh, about a dozen more that the HTTP spec defines. Head and options, I've seen some people use, but typically get, put, post, and delete. Uh, is, is all you're going to, to use to interact with REST. Um, I've got them, I, I think when you, when you look at this screen, the natural tendency, at least for me, is to say, okay, well, this is CRUD. Well, it's real close to CRUD, but it's not CRUD. Um, the, the gets and deletes are definitely uh, align with the read and deletes. Put and post are slightly different. The, uh, the put is an item potent method, the post is not. That's these little alligators here are warnings because this is a pitfall that I encountered. They're subtle differences, but they're significant. Significant. Okay. So put. Put ensures that a resource is there. Uh, and if you call it repeated times, it's still going to be there. It, you're, it's, it's one of these item potent methods that the, the properties can be updated. If I call Tim Swords and change my last name to Smith, uh, I'm going to, to do that once, and, and the, my name will be Tim Smith from that day, from that call forward until it gets changed again. But the put, uh, it just ensures that I'm there. It doesn't create two of me as well. So post is a little more uh, confusing. And I guess the best corollary I have for this is that when we, we typically do a post on an ASP Web Forms app, we're posting form fields to a parent resource. We're, we're posting it to the page URL. Um, so in that case, we're dealing with a subordinate resource to the page. Uh, so it, it doesn't actually act directly on the resource. If I wanted to post an individual form field, I would post it to its own resource URI. Uh, excuse me, I would put it to its own resource URI. So by calling post, uh, and feel free to stop me. I'm kind of settling down now, so. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, the, the, the post, it, it can be a little confusing as to when to use which, which methods. Uh, so here, more of the same. The CRUD and the REST, how, they're, how they relate to one another. Create can be a put or a post. Read can be a get, read is a get, delete's a delete. Update can be a put or a post, depending on whether or not the entity existed before calling the method. Okay, so here's, a, here's one of the things that surrogate keys or, or you know, uh, generated uh, uh, keys, primary keys in the database, auto increment keys. When you're doing a, when you're doing a, a put, an item potent put where it has to be, if I am in there once, don't put me again, just ensure that I'm there. This is kind of an issue that, I'm not saying one, one side is better than the other, but this is an, an issue that will bite you a little bit. Because if I'm using a, an auto-generated key, how do you know if I'm in there or not? You, ha you have to evaluate the entity that defines me through some other means. I have, to, I have to check for Tim, I have to check for swords, you know, how do you, if, if you had a natural key, you wouldn't have that issue. But I'm not citing, you know, saying that one way is better than another. Obviously, the surrogate keys are lovely for ORMs. Natural keys are, are nice and handy for, for puts. Uh, but just something to be aware of. Okay, so the nouns. Okay, we, we talked about the verbs. 
the, it's all about the verbs, put, post, delete, yet. Now the nouns. This is where, what defines our representations. Um, and this is kind of where, this is where it gets a little hairy, not in, in the actual nouns, but in, the, in defining the relationships amongst the nouns. So, uh, you know, if I have two tables, or, or two entities that are related somehow, how do I convey that relation in a restful way? Um, the way I chose to do it, you'll see it. Uh, actually, uh, let's jump over there right now. Uh, the first place that I started was to, okay, let me back up. The, the data model, th this, this little example that I have here, I'm a baseball fanatic, and uh, this is, I've, I've had this database that I've been working on for a couple of years, or it's been in existence. I've, been, I've probably spent two months working on it. But I thought this would make a great restful demo thing. So basically, the, I'll show you. I have pretty much every baseball stat from 1870 until 2009. I do need the last two years if anybody's interested in stealing some, some data for me. But this is, this is basically what I'm going to break down. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of data in here, but I think we've simplified it quite a bit. So there's, there's the model. I won't bore you with the details. Uh, I will tell you, uh, I mean, it, it basically deals with, you got a franchise, you got a franchise that has numerous uh, teams, field of teams, the teams have players, the players have stats. Basically, that's the level that we're going to deal with this tonight. Um, so where I started at, I, I had an idea of what it was that I wanted to convey. I, I thought I had an idea of what my representations were. Okay, franchise, there's an easy one. We need a representation for a franchise. How do I represent the teams that have played for that franchise? And how do I associate them? How do I relate them? That's where that's where I kind of went through an iterative process in defining the model. And basically, I started out with just an XML. Uh, okay, let's start with franchise. That's the easiest. Um, I just started hand coding some XML to see what my, res my uh, representations were going to look like. So I got a franchise item. It's got a name, an ID, a designator. That's your STL or BOS, whatever. Is active? Are they currently active? And then a list of teams. Um, I'm chosen, in this case, I'm going to represent the, the relationship amongst the franchise and the teams that they've fielded by these links. That's, that's pretty much the whole essence of REST is uh, the linked, da linked relational data. How do, I, uh, you know, how do I reflect that via an HTTP call? So let's go back to the, the PowerPoint, the other PowerPoint. You know what, let me, okay, did we talk about, we didn't talk about URIs. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself and I apologize. Um, okay, so a resource, every single resource is represented by one or more URIs. And I just thought this paragraph, I read this, I, I don't know, does anybody else have an issue with, the ter with URIs? <laughs> yeah, I, it's because of stuff like this that I don't, the, you know, that it's confusing and I don't, I just think, you know, okay, essentially a URL is a URI. That's good enough for me. That's all I need to know. But any URL is a URI, but some URIs aren't URLs. They're URNs instead, except the ones with, which are both URNs and URLs. So if you're anything like me, it's like, what the hell are they saying? But this picture, for what it's worth, you don't really need to know, but URI encompasses the superset of URLs URNs. That is how we're going to address every resource. It will have at least one and potentially many resources. Okay, we're going to come back to the code. I'm going to go through a few, of the, few more of the slides. It's not all just academic stuff, but uh, there is code at the end, but I want to keep it in sequence rather than jump back and forth. So um, to work with REST, we need to dig into the bowels of the response request headers as defined by the HTTP spec. The, the obvious ones, the get, uh, or, or excuse me, the HTTP method, the, the HTTP protocol, content type, and accept type. 
There's a couple more that will come up later when we talk a little bit about caching. There's e-tags, there's last modified that we're going to delve into a little bit. But this is just a kind of a high level introduction to what, what I plan on talking about. Uh, typical response code, 200 OK. The content type is the, the main thing we're going to focus in and obviously the, the payload at the bottom. Okay, oh, uh, we will talk a lot about the, these response codes are, are you know, something we're going to use a lot. Uh, I don't have them all memorized. There's quite a few of them, but these are the, the typical ones you're going to use. Uh, most of us know these. We kind of take them for granted. 200s are good. 300s, um, they can come in handy when it comes to versioning. 400s means that the client did something wrong. 500 means that the server did something wrong. But these. These are going to come into play quite a bit when we, you know, that's basically how we're going to communicate back to the client is we're going to be, to be truly RESTful, I guess, is to be pretty strict with the response, with the HTTP spec. Okay. This is kind of, this is the one where if anybody has any ideas, I'm open to this. This, this is what I know based on the research that I've done. This H-A-T-E-O-A-S, has anybody heard of that? Adios. Okay. Hypermedia is the engine of application state. This is really a cornerstone of REST. This is what allows, uh, is, allows it to, to basically act as a state machine, just trans, transitioning from state to state without caching anything on the server, without, ca without uh, intervention on the client side as well. Okay. I still don't get it. This is where I was at for quite some time. So, and basically what this means is that the server does not manage state. The state, the state is dictated by the server sending a, a, a resource and basically a, a subset of a directed graph down to the client. The client has the links to all the related resources. So they, the client maintains state, although they don't know that they maintain, they, that they maintain state. They just follow links that are presented to them from the prior state of their prior request. So understanding this is something that I struggled with tremendously. And I have an example of my perception of Hattie OS, or however you say this, about how this is really a stateless engine. OK, part of what makes REST scalable. And it is scalable, as is evidenced by the web. Okay, you notice it said application state. Hypermedia is the engine of application state. Well, there's a couple kinds of state. The application state is basically the context in which you made your last call. So, like in this example, I've got a list of teams that I had that I had from my prior response or prior request. What do those teams mean? Well, they, it could have been you know, a, a list of teams for the Boston Red Sox franchise. It could have been, you know, the teams in the National League East. It doesn't, it doesn't really have any meaning. But by virtue of getting this information down in the form of a directed graph uh, in my prior request, I have that information available. The key, the key in REST, and this is, where, this is where I would like to do some more research as well, is actually to derive some meaning in those relationships. OK, so, so I made a request, and I got a list of teams, and those teams have links to players. The browser, you know, it just sees a link. How does it know what to follow? How does it know how to derive any meaning from that link? And to me, I think that is kind of key. There's, um, I don't know if any of you looked into RDF at all, semantic web stuff. There's a resource definition framework and OWL, web ontology language, that actually, it's kind of academic right now, and that's probably why I don't understand it too much. But they have, uh, they basically deal in things with subject, object, and predicates. That you can define a link uh, in terms of a subject, object, and predicate. And, and the analogy that I use for that is, you know, an object instance would be the, the, the subject. The predicate would be a property that you want to set on that object, in, object instance. And the subject, excuse me, I said the subject is the object. Predicate is the name of the property. 
and the object is the property value that you want to apply to it. So somewhere following that sort of approach, I'm not saying RDF is the answer to everything and it's going to be a piece of cake and it's going to allow us to derive meaning from every link that we ever get on the web, but a, a real key in this would be to, to actually derive some, some meaning from the links that are presented to you. Uh, and I'm open for anybody, any suggestions on how to do that. What I've done in my demo is kind of a hack job. It, it, it's, it's functional, it works, and it kind of demonstrates the purpose, but it's a little bit of a hack job. So anyway, that's the application state is really part of the, the hypertext as, as uh, the engine of application state. That's what we're talking about. Resource state just means basically, is this representation of this player is it, is it a new, is it dirty? You know, what is this, the physical database state of it? Although it's not a database. It's a representation. We don't talk directly to the database, obviously. We talk to a representation. And this is one area where it kind of differs uh, from SOAP. You know, SOAP RPC, you're, you're actually creating a proxy. You're, you're calling a method on, you, you, you create the proxy, you call a method on that, you package it all up, you send it to the server, server deserializes it. Uh, creates that, an instance of that object, calls that method, packages up the results. Here we're dealing with the representations. We're not talking to a direct object, and that representation could have changed, uh, you know, in the, in the, since your last request. So uh, basically just something to keep in mind. Uh, the rest purists are going to say that anything that you, you put on the server to tie uh, a client to a piece of information is, is violating REST. It's going to hurt your scalability. That may or may not be an issue. You know, you, we're not Google. We're not all Google. We're not Yahoo. So there's degrees of, of freedom there, I guess, that we have. We don't all have to be completely RESTful, but this, from a purist perspective, that's going to be the, the train of thought. And this is one that I kind of mold over a little bit. How would a shopping cart work? You know, in today's world, you know, we have this, this uh, perception, well, not perception, we have this reality of page to page to page to page, and we're adding things, and it's posting a, a view state or whatever. Um, REST would say, don't do that. You just post, post a cart, post a, a cart full of items one time. Or you could do a put on a cart, you could do a post several items. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a different mentality as opposed to, you know, okay, here's my shopping cart. We're going to keep it on the client. We're going to add this. Let the server know uh, exactly that, you know, here's, here's what I'm putting into my cart. Hold this for the next round trip. Uh, you know, it's, it's a different, different approach towards uh, web. Scalability. Okay. Okay, caching. So caching, we have everything that HTTP has at its disposal for caching, uh, which we will talk about. You know, the last modifieds, we have e-tags. There's, uh, you know, proxy servers. There's what, what has made the, the web scalable is all stuff that we can leverage uh, in REST. And before too long, we're going to get into some code, and hopefully you kind of get a better feel for what I've done, right or wrong, almost. Okay, this one I thought was interesting. O Oasis, the Advancing Open Standards for the Information Society. You know, I, I guess I, I put this in here because I can't think of anybody in this room that probably doesn't fall into this second paragraph in some way, shape, or form. If you provide a uniform means to, if you offer, if you write a service, if you use a service, or use capabilities of that service, then this is applicable. So if it's applicable, you got two, two core paths you can take. You can do REST, uh, a resource-oriented architecture, or you can do a, a more SOAPy version. But they're, they're both fall under the umbrella of a service-oriented architecture approach. And um, OK, some of the. You guys probably know SOAP pretty well, I would imagine. Some of the pros and cons, it, it's been around a long time. The, the security's mature. The, to me, the, the transactional aspect of SOAP is 
probably far superior to that in REST. That's, that's probably the one area where REST, uh, there's really virtually no transactional support in REST. The security's pretty good just by virtue of internet security. You know, SSL's been around for a while. That's pretty strong. There's, there's basic and digest, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But really, if, if you're going to go with, with pick a reason for SOAP, I would say the reliable mes messaging aspect of SOAP and probably some of the security stuff. Uh, this, the pros of REST, simple, predictable, stateless, cacheable, scalable. Um, that's a pretty good selling point in a, in a lot of arenas. It, it, it's not going to be in every arena, obviously. It's going to be a tough sell in an enterprise arena, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of merit. And, you know, you, know, you can adopt it piece by piece. Okay, now about the demo. Now I'm gonna, I'll, I'll refer back to this occasionally as I bounce back and forth between the, the code and the PowerPoint. The design process. The, this is where uh, basically I had a list, I, you know, baseball, franchises, teams, players, stats. How do I want to represent those? And what I did, uh, picked out the nouns. The, the ones I just iterated were easy. But now the teams that played for a franchise are, are all the, a set of all the teams that played in 1946. How do I want to represent that? And it got a little bit hairier. So basically I went through an iterative process and ended up address, uh, uh, creating multiple instances of, of the same resource. I, I can view it in this context. I can view it in this context. And that's perfectly okay. I mean, like I said before, a resource can be addressed by multiple URIs. So it's not a big deal, but frankly, I didn't want to code, you know, nine different variations of the same thing. So, so I basically distilled it down to, to this. And I don't know if you guys can read this, but so I started out with this, the, the purpose. Here's, here's what I want out of this. And then to me, intuitively, this made like a, a, a good URI set. And this is another thing, too, to keep in mind. When you, de when you design your URIs, you know, these are, these are fairly human readable, um, but bear in mind, this is machine to machine uh, inter interaction. So these don't have to be human readable. It helps in a presentation that they are. But you know, down here, okay, I don't know a franchise ID. And if I used, you know, STL for the Cardinals, okay, that's human readable for the Cardinals, but what about the, you know, the Altoona Mountain Devils or whatever that played in 1894? How, I don't know those. So basically, these are uh, IDs that are you know, from the database that I'm passing back to the client. I'm presenting them a link. So the client never has to know the player ID. They can, they can find the, this information out just with a simple web request, but they don't need to know it. So anyway, this was a step, step one. I, okay, I, here's what I want to, to do. Here's the URI path that I'm going to do. And I, at the end, I came out with a list of representations that I wanted to, to present in code. And these are just the hand-marked XML that I came up with. So we got a, a franchise item. We talked a little bit about that. It's very simple. With, it's got a collection of teams. Uh, and a franchise list is just, uh, just a collection of links. And you'll find a lot of this repeating. Uh, Let's take a, a, you know, a player item. I've got, okay, a player item, okay, they have a list of teams that they have played for. That's one aspect of them. They've got a batting stat. Uh, and here again, the, the main content of this are, are links. This is the key. The fielding stats, okay, we're going to present them with some more links. Pitching stats, same thing. And then some core properties about that person. So I'm not going to bore you with going through every one of these, but basically this is, this is what I wanted to present as a representation. You know, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping with my entities in my database. It is, it's more of a conceptual, linked, somewhat of a, a high-level graph of relationships. So given that, I pretty much have an interface for my service. Um, Okay, and before I start in the code, I do want to say, okay, .NET, do you guys like WCF? Hands up. Do you like configuring WCF? ABCs? Yeah, right, the address binding contract. 
and behaviors and, you know, I don't know if you're like me, but I struggle with that. But they have this class, the Web Service Host Factory. And basically, I don't know if you, have you guys worked with that at all? But it configures everything for you. This is really the one line of code. And, and let me say this. When Scott did his presentation, they had the REST starter kit was, was out there in WCF 3, 5, and 4. I think they've actually pulled all that in, and now it's, it's native functionality. So basically, the system service model web, pull that in. Um, and it gives you this lovely class, Web Service Host Factory, which basically uh, configures your endpoint. If you look in the web config in the service model section, this is the entire service model section. It's more comments for my benefit right now. Really, the automatic format selection and ASP.NET compatibility enabled is all the configuration that you need to deal with, which I love that. The, uh, the routing table, if you guys have worked with MVC, it's basically, it's the same, oops, sorry. The, the same routing mechanism that the MVC is going to use. Um, so if you have MVC experience, this is going to come pretty naturally. Uh, just for fun, a couple of functions, uh, and this will be in the source code that I provide, how, how you do this manually should you want to. You don't really need, this is, this is the only line you need to get you going with REST in the, in the uh, global ASX. But it, should you choose to. This, we'll talk a little bit about consuming REST, consuming JSON. And this is the kind of crap you do when doing JSONP over localhost. Localhost and cross-site scripting, just not going to mess with it. Have to change your host file. Uh, so we'll just collapse that. We don't need to, to deal with that. So at a high level, that's, that's what we have here. Whoops. OK, we talked about the data model, franchise, team, player, stat, game. What um, you do get the data, so if you want, if you feel like you want to contribute a couple years worth of data, feel free. Just let me let me have it, please. Yeah, this is the one thing that what I just showed you, which I think is a tremendous advancement in WCF. Okay, the web get and web invoke attributes. If we look at our interface here. <coughs> Excuse me. Basically, the, the gets, anytime you do a get, you can use a web get attribute. It knows that uh, it, this is going to, to map to any get request coming in that matches your URI template. Um, and we see some parameter, right? Okay, here's a put. There, there's really only two methods there's uh, a web get for gets, there's a web invoke for puts, posts, and deletes. And you just specify the method. But in all cases, you specify a URI template, and it uses that to match every incoming request to an actual method call within your service. The one that, uh, OK, like this, and, and uh, the franchise ID, any, anything in the curly brackets has to evaluate, or has to be matched with a corresponding parameter of the same name in the method call. And they, they, <coughs> One downfall of this is they're all they're, they're strings. You have to you have to deal in strings at this point. So franchise ID is an actual integer. So you have to do the code to to handle the the conversion. And yeah, you know, I don't know. It's not that big of a deal. It's something we do pretty routinely. So basically, here's the interface and the service class that implements it is right here. And this does, uh, you know, pretty simple stuff. Let's get all franchises. This use cache, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Pretty much all of these methods look very similar. They just call into, uh, to <coughs> they call into a, a method of that class. And it basically, this class is capable of loading itself. This is the, this is the class that mirrored the XML, the hand-carved XML that I'd showed you before. 
Um, and basically, it has all the same properties. I picked a very short one. It has a list of franchises. Um, but it's, they're all, all the same. They're all capable of loading themselves. So if we go back to, where's my, get teams by year. Okay. There's really nothing to do. They're just doing selects and returns. Um, I don't know. Uh, there's not a whole lot to say on that front right there. Uh, let's go back to. Okay. Okay, the Atom 1 and RSS 2 feed formatters. That's. I have that in code, and I'm going to show you a little bit about that. Makes it real simple to uh, uh, service. I think that's at the bottom. Service model syndication. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you notice at the top, I've got this. Uh, oh, excuse me. It's in the interface. Yeah, service known type. This, uh, these two attributes here says that, uh, you know, this, this service has the potential to return either an Atom 1 feed or an RSS 2 feed. Uh, by virtue of that, then I can, I can declare a, a, an RSS 1 or Atom feed 2, or excuse me, Atom, Atom 1 RSS feed 2 feed formatter within my service and return that. And the, the uh, serialization is handled for you. Internally, you don't have to do anything. So we'll go back to the method that does that. Um, and it's not the cleanest code, but it's, not, it's also not, not the worst code either. This is a whole method that basically gets a list of franchises and turns that into a feed. And I can show you that probably works best in IE. And see if we, where's Chrome? MLB. I think that's it. We'll find out. Eh, could not. Oh, it is. I got the right URL. But yeah, basically, that little bit of code takes us and turns it into an RSS2 feed. Uh, I, I did nothing in terms of serialization. I just presented the items and assigned them to an RSS2 feed collection. Uh, okay. Okay, this is the part, this is kind of the fun part. Serializing JSON, we talked about how do you consume JSON uh, on the web? Well, this right here. Here's a, here's a string of, of JSON. Kind of, it's, it's not too nasty, but it's a little, a little, a little hairy. I do love the Buster, Red, Nippy, Clyde. That's, that's why I like baseball. But um, here, here's the method, json.stringify. I've created this, this JSON object in X. Now I'm going to call stringify.x. And I'm going to log it, and that's what I get. I get an actual string representation. It's just that simple. And probably what's even more powerful is going the other way. And that's even simpler. So taking the example that I had, I've got this string coming in that I generated from the prior slide. And I'm going to say, I'm going to declare a variable, a variable team and json.parse. And now I get a JavaScript object that I can call methods on. <coughs> so team.players2, the third guy in, in the team players collection, was Nippy Jones. And that's, it doesn't get a whole lot easier than that. So. Um, so we, yeah, you you probably find yourself using that quite a bit. You might you might be in XML. Yeah, it, it's it, XML parsing XML in JavaScript is that's it's quite a bit harder. That's why the, the ease with which you can parse it in JSON and manipulate it in JSON is really uh, I think that's really why JSON's becoming so popular on the web. It's just it's native to Java. It is JavaScript. So, okay, this one, 
I don't know that I would ever use this, but this is something I came up in my research, the web channel factory that basically allows you to call this service in a, like a .NET to .NET realm. It's very slow, but it's basically, it's very, it's a very soapy looking method, very soapy behaving method. It's fairly, fairly heavy. But you know, in here, franchise 101 is the Cardinals, franchise 106 is the Rangers. So uh, basically, what I, I didn't spend a whole lot of time on this, so behind the scenes, I don't know what is actually going on. Is this making a true soap call? Uh, I don't know, but, but it illustrates a point that I can write a RESTful service exposed over HTTP and consume it in another fashion. You know, I could always do an HTTP web request and process the response that way as well. There's several avenues you have to consume a REST service. Anybody keep going? Everybody want to go home? Uh, Jason P. This, uh, have you guys worked with Jason P. at all? Anybody familiar with? It's basically you can't. A browser is going to complain if you try to pull down a JavaScript object, a, a JSON object from another uh, from another domain. If, if the domain source, or excuse me, the domain protocol or a port differ, it's going to complain. How this slipped through the cracks, I don't know, but I can pull in a script from anywhere. Doesn't matter. So well, what Jason P does is exploit that fact and would put a callback parameter at the end. So we're basically calling some other domain just as we normally would, and on the get parameter we've got a callback equals call me. Well, I have this function call me on my page already. It's just waiting to be called. and what Jason P will actually do, it will create a script node so that it can pull it in from a from cross domain, and it'll take the the callback parameter, the call me, and invoke that with the item, uh, with the JSON item that you got from the server. So it's it's just a way around cross domain scripting. I don't know if that's good or bad, but you know you're going to find that you're going to need a. a, a, a pretty frequently to, be, to call cross-domain sites and pull back JSON or pull back XML. Well, this, you, you, you could do it with XML. I've never, never tried it with XML, but this is how you're going to do that. And I will tell you, Jason, or excuse me, jQuery makes this pretty easy. Basically, it's setting a parameter. You specify a callback, and you tell it that it is JSONP. And the only difference between JSON and JSONP is that they wrap JSON P in, a, in an X equals parentheses, and then your JSON blob. That's, it's very subtle, but if, if you read the literature on it, it's confusing. Uh, and if you're like me, it's even more confusing. But it, it's actually pretty simple in practice. OK, exception handling and response codes. Let's go back to the demo. We haven't really flushed out that. There's not a whole lot more. I do want to show you some things with, uh, okay, here's, here's the demo. Basically what I've done, wh what I want to show here, I, I've, I've spent no time in making this pretty, none. Uh, I found a one-liner little output, a uh, little JavaScript utility that takes JSON and formats it, and this is what you get, and I was happy with that, and that looks good. But basically what this demonstrates is that all of these have, they'll return a little miniature nested graph, or uh, directed graph, so that if I click on, you know, got a favorite team, spit out a team. Cubs? Okay, you want to go back to the white stockings years, or you want to go a little more modern? Basically, the, the, now this is a list of teams in context. We know this, these are all teams that played for the Chicago Cubs franchise. So if we say 2007, we get more, this is the list of players that played for the Cubs in 2007. Um, the client is not doing anything to maintain state, knowingly. The server's not maintaining state, obviously. So uh, it's just happening. This, these relationships are presented via, via the links that these JSON calls are actually returning. And this is where that Hattie OS or whatever, Hypermedia is the engine of application state. This is where really, uh, to me, kind of sunk home, is that all this stuff is going on. We've got stuff within context. 
and nobody's tracking it and we can cache it and that's where we can really gain quite a bit but uh, anybody know the name of the first Yankees franchise team no Baltimore Orioles I just thought that was kind of a cool little they started out as the Baltimore Orioles so Anyway, I can bore you with baseball crap, as some of you well know, but uh, I apologize for that. Okay, um, two teams that have never been to the World Series. There's two of them. Can you name them? You think them on that, and I'll get my thoughts together. <laughs> Don't everybody shout at once. Uh, okay. So one thing I did want to show uh, was a little bit with Fiddler. Um, basically, we can go back at the top here. We'll stick with one at the top. But, okay, I just made a request. And here is the actual response. Let's get some screen here. Okay. Okay. So this came back in JSON, and we can view it raw. This is what I got back from the server by clicking on the Arizona. Now, if I want to come over here, there's a cool little tool. You know, it comes in very handy with REST, is this request builder. I can do, let's grab this URL. Um, let me just type this or copy it. Or we'll just type it in manually. Request Builder. Okay. Local host. Uh, by one. Okay. So I'm going to do a get on that. And this is the request that I just made. And if you'll notice, the, uh, where's the raw? Okay. What did I, let me go back to the request builder. Whoops. Let's do, ah, thank you. Where's your delete key? Branch size is three. Okay, that looks a little bit better. So if we view this raw, there's our JSON right there. All I need to do is come back over here, and there's a little piece in .NET that makes this so trivial that you don't even have to think about it. I can come over here and say, uh, accept application slash XML and then execute it come over here and now if I look at it raw I have lovely XML and how that's done with uh, with how dotnet is doing that is basically one little flag automatic format selection and that's it I mean that's a pretty powerful tool. So now for many client, if I want XML, I just specify it in my request header. If I want JSON, specify it in the request header. And that's it. Which to me, I thought was pretty sweet. And uh, you know, you can set a default, you can, you can force them. You don't, you know, obviously you don't have to, if you want to supply only JSON, turn this off and set your default return value to JSON and it'll override. You know, the content headers aren't the end all be all. You can say, I accept this, but server can't send it, they can't send it. You get what the server has. Um, so back to, fit. oh, no, the one thing I did want to show, which I thought was pretty cool in, let's stop this guy. Where? Okay, in the service, the caching aspect, um, I need more screen real estate. Okay, use cache. Let's go to this guy. 
And this was just a little hack that I put in for the demo. But where's the F12? Okay. Oh, actually, we had this on, so I've been caching. So I thought that was off. Okay, so now if we come back to Fiddler and look at this. You'll notice that I've been to Arizona, nothing, nothing in here. If I go, to, I haven't been to the 1999 Arizona, okay. So then it makes the request. Um, go back. This is, this is the caching in action. All I've done was add a last modified date and it, I gave it, you know, some crazy two years in the past. It's like, okay, I don't need that. I've, I'm, I've got what I need so it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, request anything on the server. And that's really what makes this, this stuff scalable. So 2003, but let's go back to, you know, we don't have to go through this one. I know I've hit 98. I know I've, I've not hit. So now if I go back, this one will not cause a request. And now 98, let's clear this. Now if I go to the 98 Arizona Diamondbacks, nothing. And that's the, that's the scalable. That's the beauty of, of what you can do. This is what makes it, makes it tick. Uh, okay. So uh, exception handling, response codes, basically every, every bit of information that you want to convey back to a client, use the HTTP spec. That's, that defines your response codes. Stick with that. And it's okay, you know, you're not limited to one response code. Add two, three, four, whatever you need to convey whatever level of detail to your, to your clients, doesn't matter. So, uh, and you know, this is the, the yellow screen of death that you see Microsoft has added a body, no problem. Add a body, you can, you, there's, uh, for, you can present as little or as much information to your consumers as need be. Okay, this caching, th this might be stuff that you work with every day, you may be intimately familiar with, you may not be, but this is really, this is how it works and this is what makes REST scalable. And the, the, the sequence of events, uh, the initial get and you get the payload, and it goes into cache. From that point on, uh, you're gonna do a conditional get and you're gonna check a, a, a modified date or if none match, this is, this is for, for use with e-tags, which is basically a GUID a server-side GUID that through whatever mechanism you want, it gets updated whenever that associated entity is updated. So a new one, it, it, becomes, it becomes stale at some point. If the client has an old one, it's since been updated, the GUIDs won't match. If none match, then it's gonna return the whole payload back. If, if, if a, an e-tag matches what the client has, it's gonna return a 304 not modified with an empty body, and that's it. But this is a, this and the fact that nothing is on the server in terms of state management is what make rest, makes REST scalable. Okay, we're getting close to being done. I don't know how I'm doing on time. But. Um, security, here again, you're, you're kind of tied to, to HTTP and basic over SSL, digest. The, uh, I don't know, do you know of anybody that's broken SSL? Anybody? I mean, it, do you think there has been? Okay, so there. It, so that's something you need to consider. You know, if, if you know, Basic's going to send raw credentials. Well, not raw. Base64 encoded credentials. So it's not infallible. Digest is uh, basically the same thing, other than the fact that the credentials are not sent. Uh, just a username is sent, and then uh, a non a one-time sequence is generated on the server. Um, and that's sent back to the client. The client then hashes its username password with that nonce, returns the result back, does a comparison. This hash message authentication code, this was actually on uh, Microsoft's best practices, or, or uh, an article that I found from the MSDN. And um, basically, if you look at it, I have it on the next page. If you look at it, it looks an awful lot like homegrown, uh, Digest authentication, 
I'm not sure. I put this in here if somebody wanted to see kind of the bowels of what you could do. I'm not sure I would recommend it. You know, HTTP spec, that's pretty good security. Um, if it's not good enough for you, then there's soap. You always got soap. Um, but basically, I, felt, I saw very little difference in the way this was implemented and how digest was implemented. So take it with a grain of salt. And then this was fun. I got into OAuth. And this is where, this is where I kind of began and ended. And this is basically a, a, a way for me to tell Alan, yeah, you can, you can see I, I'm going to give you access to my pictures, my, some resource of mine. And it looks pretty simple on the, on the surface. In, in the, the sentence is a piece of cake. But this is all the stuff that's going on. And I, this is why I took the, the spec and drew this out. And I won't even claim 100% accuracy. I think it's, it's as accurate as I could read a spec and make sense out of it. But I thought this would be a, a, maybe a, a good segue into another topic. You know, this, a, a lot of people are using this in the, in the open source world. I don't know. I don't know where, where the future of it is, but it's definitely something worth entertaining. I mean, it's uh, basically there's a common API between the, the servers that you want to share a resource amongst. And um, there are some, there's some .NET libraries that facilitate this. I did not take time to actually put this picture to code. Um, frankly, not that interested. <laughs> Maybe say, like I said, for another day. But it's basically, it's definitely something to consider going forward. You know, there might be some merit to this. Uh, that and OData, I think is, uh, oh, we'll come back to this. But oh, yeah, OData, and I know very little about that. Has anybody here worked on OData? No? To me, the whole key in this thing is, is getting the semantic meaning of this link. You know. I've got, a, I've got a, a resource representation. How do I derive some meaning into a relationship that's conveyed in that, in that representation? That's the key. That's, that's not the easy part. But OData, I think, is making strides through that. They, like I said, RDF and OWL are just, just paths that I started venturing on, trying to make sense of this, but didn't, didn't fully flesh out. Um, how do you version a REST service? You got a, a few options. <coughs> the first one is the, uh, the 301 moved permanently. Uh, this I didn't know. You, you can actually create your own MIME types with the version in it. And at this point, the client would would say, "Okay, I want version one. I want version two. Um, this is, I guess, outside of I can. Um, or you can just define your your URIs." to accommodate a version. So MLB franchise v1.0 slash teams, v2.0 slash teams. It's going to map to a totally different resource. And I think, where to next? OData. OData and OAuth, I think, have, they have my interest. Uh, you notice I have one, one reference. Because <laughs> if you know this, you know REST. And that's what I, you know, I, I could have muddied the waters with a bunch of, of, of references. This is the one that defines rest. So I felt it deserved its own place on my bibliography. And besides, I forgot all the places I visited on the web. There's thousands, hundreds. But uh, anyway, that's uh, about all I have. Do you have any questions? Or how are we doing on time? Shoot. Awesome. Um, it seems like if you keep your data public and you don't secure it, this seems to be a wonderful technology for publishing open data and things. Scenarios for corporation, though, like with an intranet and like data mining, mm -hmm. this, where do you think this could be used from a corporate setting as opposed to like a Google setting where they publish? Data? Yeah, that's a good, good, good question. Good point. And uh, I guess I'll start by saying, it may not be the perfect solution for every, every scenario. Uh, that's a very good case in point for, for SOAP and RPC and the WS star stack. Um, not to say that it could not be secured, though. You know, via, via SSL, via digest uh, authentication. 
be a be a homegrown. I mean, it's it's securable, but its its security is less mature, less tested than SOAP and RPC. Um, that said, you know, I, I'm not a security expert. You saw my picture of OAuth. I don't under, I don't get it. Sort of do, but. Um, you know, at that point, that's when uh, you, you need to make a, a decision is this might be a better avenue for SOAP, for RPC. Did that answer your, I mean, it, it's something you definitely have to, this does not put SOAP out of, out of business by any, any stretch of the imagination. Right, things like workflows, you know, long live transactional kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Um, you know what? I haven't done a lot with workflows. You probably can, but within a different context, you're going to have to have something around it. Um, yeah, I'm not sure where. Go ahead. No, I'm just saying it sounds like you've got a lead in for something else, so go ahead. No, I'm just thinking, okay, in a very, my simplistic knowledge of, uh, of the WWF, the workflows, basically, okay, you want to trigger an event that's going to, at this point, I'm going to insert something into a database. I don't know of anything that would really preclude rest. Right, uh, it's, it's a scaffolding over top and you use rest for your data persistence and mm -hmm. for updating the consumption thing. Right. Okay. But by itself, it doesn't have any mechanism for that. By itself? Yeah. No. No, it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's selling point really is in a reduced interview. It, it, all it knows is put, post, get, and delete. And, and URIs. That's it. Um, that that is its entire interface to the to the outside world. Did I am I answering your question or am I taking you? Oh, I think you're doing just fine on that one because like that was just kind of an open ended and serious question. Okay. Um, no. Clap. <laughs> I'm so glad this is over. <laughs> thanks, Alan. Thanks for uh, inviting me, and thanks for taking the time. Thanks for coming out tonight.